Hello everyone and welcome to part one on spine fractures. Today we'll be discussing introductory fundamentals about spine fractures and then go over some of the more general fracture types. In part two we will be going over the more cervical spine specific fractures as there are tons of unique ones out there as the anatomy of the cervical spine is a little bit different than the thoracolumbar lumbar spine. Early action is crucial to good outcomes in cases of suspected spine trauma. You want to evaluate the ABCs as well as the vital signs and place a cervical collar and backboard as soon as possible. A neuro exam is extremely helpful as it can inform you of other injuries, including injuries to the spinal cord. First line imaging is a non-contrasted CT for evaluation of bony anatomy. Prior to removing the C collar or backboard, you want to rule out a fracture. If you happen to rule in a fracture, you want to assess if it is stable or unstable. More on that later. Some dreaded sequelae of spine fractures are permanent neurological deficits, including becoming plegic. Some clues on imaging, including ligamentous tear, which can lead to spinal column instability. Epidural or subdural hematomas can then expand and lead to compressive symptoms. And more minor, but not insignificant, is damage to surrounding soft tissues including muscle and fat. Not to go too much into the biophysics, but there are different ways to injure your spine. Common injuries include hyperflexion or hyperextension, usually from a motor vehicle collision. Your spinal column only has so much give. So if you have large forces or multiple forces acting upon it, then you are likely to disrupt some part of the spine, which can lead to injury, fracture, and even paralysis. I will try to include these different biophysics injury mechanisms wherever I can when we start to talk about the different types of fractures. There is a landmark paper from 1983 that describes the three column theory. This was originally intended for the thoracic and lumbar spines, but its principles can be applied to the cervical spine. This theory divides the spine into three columns, anterior, middle, and posterior columns. It generically states that fractures that involve only a single column tend to be stable, while fractures involving two or more contiguous columns tend to be unstable. The reason for that is that an injury to one isolated portion of the spine would not compromise the integrity of the entire spine, as there are other bony and ligamentous segments that stabilize the spine. An example of a single column stable fracture would be an anterior wedge fracture, where only the anterior portion of the vertebral body is injured. An example of a multi-column fra unstable fracture would be a chance fracture, which is a horizontal fracture plane through all three columns. More details on each of these fractures later. As discussed earlier, once you rule in a fracture, you need to decide whether it is stable or unstable. Typical features of stable fractures include isolated anterior column fractures, with minimal to no exam findings. These patients are typically treated conservatively and require no intervention. Unstable fractures, however, typically involve more than one column and involve the middle and posterior columns. Other findings include bony retropulsion, in which the bony fragments of the vertebral body are pushed back into the canal space. Spondylolisthesis, which is a slippage of one vertebral body over another, can also occur. Malalignment often occurs when the ligaments are compromised and are unable to hold the bony anatomy in place. Patients with unstable fractures very often require surgical fixation. The most important take home message is this. In the setting of trauma, if you find one single spine fracture, then it is your indication to image the entire spine. That being up to 20% of trauma patients with a spine fracture have another spine fracture in another segment. Now we're going to cover the general types of fractures. These fractures may occur at any level of the spine. Where applicable, I will describe the biophysics, etiology, and radiographic features. First, we have wedge fractures. These fractures may occur in the setting of high-velocity trauma, but typically occur in elderly patients with osteoporosis.
Patients with osteoporosis are at high risk for compression fractures, of which wedge fractures are a subtype. Wedge fractures are typically only involving the anterior column, and you can see here how it is anteriorly wedged. This is by far the most common type of fracture, and of course, radiographically, it appears as a wedge shape. Burst fractures are also a type of compression fracture. These involve the entirety of the vertebral body, i.e. both the anterior and middle columns, which includes the posterior wall. They may be incomplete or complete, depending on if one or both of the end plates are involved. In this case, both end plates are involved. These fractures result in significant height loss and have a high risk of bony retropulsion with possible resultant canal stenosis or cord injury. In this case, you can see it going extending posteriorly into the canal space. Chance fractures are a type of flexion distraction injury. The body flexes while being held in place, such as by a seatbelt. The distraction part is that parts of the spine that has insertions may become distracted or separated from the rest of the bony segment. These fractures are notoriously unstable and associated with additional injuries such as solid intra-abdominal organ lacerations. These fractures radiographically demonstrate features of a wedge fracture coupled with continuation of the fracture plane posteriorly involving all three columns as you can see here. If you recall, the transverse processes are the two processes that protrude laterally at the posterior portion of the vertebrae. The spinous process is the posteriorly protruding portion. Fractures of the transverse process is commonly due to trauma and lateral flexion or extension in which the distal end of the process pulls away. Again, these are associated with other injuries even though the fractures themselves are often minor. Given the nature of the mechanism of injury, there are often multiple transverse process fractures that occur lower down in the back. Again, CT is the preferred study for evaluating bony anatomy. Briefly, spondylolysis is a bilateral pars interarticularis fracture. Recall the pars interarticularis is the space between the superior and inferior articulating processes. Patients with spondylolysis often do repetitive activities such as gymnastics, resulting in microtraumas that accumulate over time. Or they may simply have been in a high velocity trauma. The vast majority occur at the level of L5, and these patients run the risk of spondylolisthesis because of the disruption in the bony anatomy. In this particular image, you can see the two areas of defect here, indicating the bilateral pars interarticularis fracture. And while we cannot ascertain spondylolisthesis from axial slices, we can be clued in by the elongated and oblong shape of the spinal canal. Lastly, to be thorough, we included sacral insufficiency fractures. These are a type of stress fracture due to long history of osteoporosis or bisphosphonate use. They pose a diagnostic challenge as you really have to look closely to find it. And sometimes it does not even show up on CT. In these patients, acute fractures may be found on MRI due to the high bone marrow edema signal. Thank you all for listening. In part two, we will discuss cervical spine specific fractures.